American usage and received a fellowship in Hindi literature from the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. His work has appeared in several online print journals. Sarajit is also the co-founder and editorial director of Copperpoint, a multilingual publishing company. Sarajit. And uh, Miss Saima Afreen. Saima Afreen has just published her debut poetry collection, Sin of Semantics, Copperpoint. Her poems have been published in several national and international journals. She has been awarded, awarded Charles Wallace Fellowship at the University of Kent, UK for the year 2019. So with this, let us begin this evening of poetry. I will request Roshanji uh, to start the program. Worried more and uh, Share it in here today. This poem, Knotted Inside Me, was the first poem that gave me my definition of being a poet. Until then, I couldn't call myself. Until then, I couldn't call myself a poet. I always thought I was a short story writer. Knotted Inside Me. At the time of my birth, my small town, Kalyan, did not have a library. It had no road rage, few beggars, one defunct traffic signal at Mubar Road, and fewer cars. Horizontal buildings silhouetting the sun in shanties, stalls, and cottages. Its outline, jointed and dwarfed, with self-sustaining jobs of kiranawalas, primary school teachers, factory workers, dentists, general practitioners, cycle repair shops, and a small bank, let's not forget, on Namba Green. It was thrown deaf to career ladders, Six Sigmas, MNCs, pecking orders, filled with Pawalas, Mohammedans, Hindus, Bawas, North Indians, South Indians, non Catholics, non Hindus, non Muslims, non Dalits, and non Brahmins. The ice factory owner, the mayor, a smuggler, a customs officer were the rich. Their bungalow gardens, terraces, compound walls, sprinted over by well fed dogs. Pressing against our imagination, mostly during New Year resolutions. The Sindhis lived in a neighbor town with plenty of gold and goods. In the year of my sister's birth, some of their buildings collapsed like crumbling cake in blood and crust. There was one gang war in Kalyan, one Anglo Indian killed by a bone goon on a night road, a gunshot running through his race, history, legacy and a schoolboy murdered in cold gang boy rage. I with the other girls were bottom felt, walking through the college corridors. That was all we had before I left for the city. But a town I had left behind like shoes outside the temple multiplied around me a thousand times. This poem the second one that I'm going to read is called Transmogrified and it has been uh, very fortunately translated into Arabic, into Gujarati, into Marathi and I see even Hungarian and uh, this is the only poem that is being very mischievous world over. So here I bring it to you in its original English. He was first a snake and was in love with a she-snake and then he molded. And after he molded, he was a turtle, and he met another she turtle, and fell in love with her. When he tishelled after years, he became a four-legged animal, black spots sprouting over his fur, and he fell for a leopard. He moved this way through the jungles, the savannas, the deserts, the skies, to the oceans, the air, the land, and beneath it, changing and changing and meeting and falling in love with new she species. The lovers he left behind did not change. They were who they were, the same. They were individualistic, so to speak. But now they were also heartbroken and full of hate for him. The one who had left in the middle of sometimes passionate love making. They had no idea how it was to live so many lives in one life like him. 
to take no breaks with rebirths from being mosquito to man. Sometimes evolution and progress is so fast, blessings and curses are all mixed up and one. Thank you. And whenever it is the afternoon, and whenever I am in school or college, I always have to read Biscuity Love. Because with the school and with the college, it's about love. With the grown-ups, grown -ups, it's about tea time and biscuits. And I remember somebody asking me why the title was Biscuity and should it have been Biscotti? And I'm like, no, Biscuity is a word in <laughs> India. Memory is images of a prepubescent boy cycling home. Parag make packets in one of his arms. Feeding biscuits to a stray gaggle of brown dogs wagging their shins. Large half moon eyes, kind salivating tongue. His smile showed no cookie crescent as he fed them all. He was my first love. More than the girls, the cows and canines gave his way home. This small towner of a bygone bark who found humans in animals, he grew hunger in me. Now in this morphing, super quick India, his animals are holographic. His love fades cookie slim into the sun of many states, days, time zones. He has not one trail from work to home, but ten homes. He, the color of chocolate, almond and dominant. He found love in many cities, technology girls, animals and liberated women, who fed off his glucose, milk, sugar, marmalade. They never grew thin. Over the trail of his virgin white honey, the scent of shud desi, old world in new crackling wrapping, always with a 30% improved marking. Bearing the saccharine of my bites and goose bumps, he now breaks under my neurotic granular breath. Chai made to bawa, picked out, wafer thin, milk crust, my picnic, my paleji tiger, Oreo bourbon, mall shelf Belgium, online baked and ordered. Same old, same new, premium cream crunch love. Nice. I think you will try time. <laughs> this is what it was. I'm uh, also into uh, into the hybrid form, which is a Japanese prose poetry form that has a bit of prose and a bit of haiku. And sometimes I find it is easy to express my thoughts and ideas in this prose, part prose, part poetry form than free verse. And so I'm going to share two of my haiku from this book, Paper Asylum. Snakes and Ladders. I met Mrs. Kumar twice in my life. The first when I was an administrative assistant and she, a wife, a, the wife of a man who had climbed the slippery corporate ladder to become head of HR. She looked resplendent in her opagine colored sari of gold borders and wore heavy jewelry, as if it was a wedding and not a corporate dinner. She banded with the wives of other directors and was inclusive of me too, in a mirthful way, like people are when good fortune smiles upon them. She spoke about a new car and how it glided over roads. Reminds me of a plane just about to take off. Her eyes brightened. She spoke of her children's achievements, exotic holidays, the number of support staff she had hired. All through the party, she looked at Mr. Kumar, who with a gang of equal men was getting one notch closer to his subconscious over his feet. Equinox, fitting my desires into yours. Years later, when I meet Mrs. Kumar, she is the wife of a retired director. Her sari is sober to go with the grey of her hair. I walk up to her, half expecting to hear her tales. She greets me absentmindedly and says they have travelled in a cab. Better not to have a car. The services, the chauffeur, so much expenditure. Cabs are the easiest to hire. She shrugs and stays on the outer orbits of the ladies' group, savouring each piece of finger food made in rounds on silver plates. She doesn't watch out for Mr. Kumar, who is still losing his consciousness over whiskey with the boys, the new horses of the stable, one being my husband. 
summer attire, the second innings of our relationships. And the last one that I will share with you is uh, something around terrorism and because terrorism seeps into our blood and our blood seeps into poetry, somehow I don't know how porous our walls are becoming as we as thinkers interact with the world, not only in wakefulness but also in dream and sleep. Shabbat House. For two nights and two days, the Shabbat House is the center of the news on TV. Under attack by terrorists, defended by commandos, it feels first like a video game but then all too real. A child amid the blood of his father, mother and others is rescued by his nanny and taken to a faraway place. That year in November, terror almost won. It is difficult to understand pushback when grudge fossilizes and blood begets blood throughout history. I often think of the child Moshe whenever my city is at its seams blowing to dust under surgical incisions of flyovers or wrecked by rain havoc. Now there is news of him returning to live in the same house, one day like his parents. Staying firm and fearless in a world of living love, they say he will follow in the steps of his father and mother and become a rabbi. Forgiveness that might delete memory and perhaps alter the course of history. Molecules of a blood of a beloved rife in the air, the soil, returning hope and peace to the soul. Spring migration, praying in the direction of home. Bodhi tree, spears blossoming into stipules. Thank you. For one more? Yes. Okay. Maybe you can do it in a second round. Like that, like we did. What is this? I have a second part. Second. Okay, yes. then start. Okay. Anish in one of the host walls housed a stone image of Mother Goda. 
a priest sat cross-legged near the holy cavity. His mouth let out the stream of the stream's history. You were made to repeat a few shlokas, all of which had to do with your health, well-being, and fulfillment of wishes. As you recited those sharp words, a waft of incense smoke mingled with your breath and your eyes closed of their own accord. A feeling that your visit was completed blossomed, so that your heart and mind with the mountainness of gratitude, you made to begin the descent from a mystical mountain. You gave back the empty wicker plate to the flower seller and looked at the sky, which seemed to canopy with a clear eye motherly love the faith that the shrine had accumulated over the centuries. On your way down, you saw her against grass and sky. She was sitting by the wayside, selling bananas and cucumbers. You didn't want to eat, but you stopped. How much for a cucumber? Two for ten. You looked into her eyes, unrustled by the early afternoon mountain breeze. Give me two. Do you have change for 50 rupees? She shook her head, slowly. I have some change, but I am 50 as a shot of 10 rupees. Is that fine? With a nod, she started peeling the cucumber. Her forehead smooth and her face calm. Her face not older than 14 years. Her silence invited a question from you. Do you come here every day? Yes. From the town you mean? She nodded. Do you go to school? Again not, but this time read in silence. But it was too late. You had asked her something you would have easily, easily guessed. A loop of remorse caught your heart and tugged at it. Her eyes exuded the despair <coughs> that village folks grow up with and learn to live by with time. It was time to move on. Time to leave someone to her poison and quiet. After walking a few paces, you turned your head. She was looking at you. The silence of her eyes sent you a message of contentment, which could easily be mistaken for resignation. You hadn't asked her name, but you knew what it was. Before making friends in real life, you see, I made friends with a boy in the textbook when I was six years old. This poem is for him. It's titled, A Patch of Sunlight. <clears throat> you wondered where in the city he lived. The little boy balanced on his bicycle, the tip of his tie fluttering. You wanted the textbook to be more precise. The place name wasn't enough. The name of the neighborhood would have helped. After school, you could have gone there and told the boy how lovely he looked in the sketch with his tousled hair and wind-blown tie. Perhaps you could have even asked him how his parents allowed him to ride to school all by himself. Asked him the exact time of day the draftsmen had captured him in pencil strokes. You could have also asked the boy if every morning he could, as he cycled, Notice that your eyes were covered with clouds. The sky deepening its blue as the line between your lips widened with a smile. Maybe that would have allayed your fear that the boy would be stifled inside the book as soon as you turned the page to move on to the next lesson. You would then have known that he was as bright as a patch of sunlight which always remains on top, no matter how many pages you turn. This one is titled, Unlearning Kabi. The unseen singer living in the heart sings. Keep listening to the song. Keep crushing grass. No matter what river bank you are at, there's no room for anything in the song but doom. The loom is lucid in its rattle. Just hold on to the chosen thread to reach the source of the thought that has robbed you of peace. This poet weaver, perhaps armchair potter too, 
will never become obsolete. A cloth of earth in its fingers will always be an enchanting weapon, threatening to match the mundane with a decisiveness impossible to undo. Aiming for your heart, he will hurl the maxim human mud ball at you as your outstretched arm flashes a denying palm, less of a shield, more of a shatter that multiplies the airborne blob into a quick spatter of mud beads adorning the face. Then it's up to you. See if sifting through the glossary of burial rites you're ready to be fooled into giving up on your accrued sum of infinitesimals this easily. It's not just the grit and the words that will get you, but also the voice they bear. Mud is the only music spread in the corpus of the weaver's poetry, each word reminding of the mortal remains being dug into dirt even before the eyes can let out their final squash to wash down what it took for mere mud marks. Let the mudlark hiding in the heart continue to turn the silt that was once one with the river, with the voice of the river, till your fingers glow with permanent grains promising the harvest of private wisdom. Let closed eyes read what you have never written. But what you know is always lurking in the dark interior. It is then that the ear will get accustomed to the repetitive counsel. Make mud. Make it mud. Make it one with mud. This one is titled a clock in the far past. <clears throat> At times, all you remember of a place is the walls that surrounded you. While the summer outside heaved its way through a long, lonely afternoon. Through the haze of distance, the roof to wall right angle continues to gaze at you with a spare longing. Your eyes gently unlock themselves from the persuasive nook, not without a feeling of guilt, and slide down where the clock had stopped keeping time. It wasn't ten, ten, as images of clocks are fond of showing, but some hour that's been swallowed by the windy darkness of a tunnel, now extinct. But what you can't figure out now is the sudden urge to make that stop clock again, as if a few tweaks to it in the far past would set at least something in your present time right. This one is titled Touch. There's a lake you see in the Ajanta range of hills on your way from Shegaon to Bulhan. You are told that the dam builders chose not to pull down the temple rising in solitude from the middle of the water as its priests pleaded to let it stand, promising they would carry the presiding deity elsewhere. Not very far from the water's edge, the uncomplaining god's new home amasses daylight as if to allay the loneliness that thickens at night. Even amid the sounds of vehicles charting their zigzag destinies. While worshippers visit the new temple first before moving lakewards, to view their gods almost submerged abode, wanderers, not always non believers, head straight for the water to dip their hands. So when your friend says, It's good to wash your hands before praying, let's go to the temple now. You reply without hesitation. The meeting has happened. The water has been kind. A drop of it on the fingertip is enough. It has already carried my touch to the feet of the divine. They just transferred his image. But he still lives in his old house. Just as we all continue to live in our first houses. Even if our physical selves are made to leave them. 
alive in his heart and Kashmir. The spoon tinkles with something in his eyes. The sun is too bright to read. The current history in his wrinkles. The couplet slows down where the train he alighted from and his other day. He looks down at the rim of the cup, the brown water wells up to the top. He has stopped humming, his eyes fixed on the lips of a young man in a green shirt. My father, who also hung the couplet, till the day he came home, wrapped into the arts of white. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is uh, from the partition. I was once interviewing a Sufi singer and he was telling me the tale of his mother, how she was kidnapped and taken to the other side of the border. She married there and uh, again she was brought back to India. And I often feel what a woman must have felt that she was married again, she was brought back. I mean, it's about that lady. <coughs> And she needs somebody's grandmother, so I'm talking to her voice. The title of the poem is The Charcoal My Grandmother Left. There she is again in the shadows of a white cotton sari, sitting smiling on the charcoal. She chose from her father's house as a 13 year old bride, when red was the only color she knew. Then she saw her house near the border of Pakistan. A white square fading in an orange dust. All that was left in her eyes was the print of barbed wires and prayers in her lips. The rosary moving between her fingers. The charcoal creaked under the weight of violence her face sighed. Each rope in its crisscross knew a day. The lemon pickles drying in the sun and wobbling in the chalk stories. She heard from the Luchino Mass, who saw the sunlight in glass jars. Later, the sun was outside in all of eyes. A beam was worth millions of lives. Faces grew like jungle, stuck in my grandmother's braid, then black. She saw flags like hawks hovering against the blue of her eyes. A strip of the sky remained in her eyes. She plucked that and kept it under her pillow. The summer moon often looks at the silent charcoal that she left for us. Its ropes are the DNA of our history. My hands touch its wooden legs. All history shifts in under the map my grandmother took with her.
going to read a poem called uh, Song for a Dust Candle I Met Last Winter. We have a dust candle on the audience. Mr. Darish, I think he's here. And uh, it started from there and it traveled across the country. And the team had come to Hyderabad to perform for their chance of putting mixed talking to them. And the way they perform is systematical. It's very difficult to go on the stage and remember all these old Urdu words. Some of them are learning. Presenting song for a dust bundle I met last winter. Above the red volcano, so I there's a voice released from the wings of fireflies. Afternoon holds itself in the castles of the Ismail River. It picks slivers of echoes in a ruined Arab temple. You shake it and capture the little table. In a silver bowl under its current opens a page, and more pages, your pages. A few mouths were filled with the dead stars, faint glimmer of a dying ocean. Its ink is the last mark left. You cannot tear its satin skin from Gully Kasanjan, even when the dogs chew your bones, mock the sweet fountains and your fingers. You scoot the sky and spread it on the white mattress. Your fingers turn to stones, you wave them, the way Afrasia casts a spell. You don't have gems, dwarfs and fairies. Faces move with you from Poheka to Hindustan, with Naladamendi, clouds and shrouds. The volcano is freezing, open your weather-beaten fingers. There are epics waiting to be released. I'm going to read Unknown, and this is for Josma Fanija, who is a poet from Bajra Pradesh, and she is the visual challenge. But the way she presents colors and images and poetry is marvelous, and she's a delight to talk to. And she teaches at Delhi University, so the Delhi connection I was talking about. Okay. And she was born uh, in a village which has a manufacturing unit of uh, ceramic horses. And somehow I connected with ceramic horses of Juna, which is very famous for this country. Presenting ceramic horses of Juna for Jyotisna Khalidja. Ceramic horses of Juna shaped the streets of my childhood. A kingdom of clay cups hinged on gold. The sleeping trees gift green shadows to puddles, paper bowls whisper, forbidden hymns to the light confined rain water. Tiny boxes on a reed mat pucker their lips to the sunlight, and wrap with seven colors, and know that light cannot be stars. The black stars within. The goal of dawn covering the kingdom of darkness is a myth. Its denizens don't care to pick gold and silvers. They have the legend safe, buried in modesty. Possibilized roses more ancient than the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro. The dark mouths of Junavasas drink the day the red clay. In the bellies, mohals crossing the Ganga and Sapahana splashing the Godavi. Stay warm. The kingdom's not faded glaze. Pass from water's dreams to the jasmine fingers of Jyotsna, who strokes the girl shape, the tiny handles, the boss feel. <coughs> she puts her words inside, scoops the space. It is a cool shadow under the scent of Kachna trees. She pulls its yarns, sits and knits. Sweet darkness. So I think so we can have another round with two three points to share each point. So this point that I'm going to read, he owns, is from my third book of poetry, In Glorious Coins in the Counting House, which that is short history of one over and longest to get one, and I'm waiting for it to be finally published somewhere. It's called Key Holds, and uh, sometimes as a poet, when I converse with the world, uh, as 
a short story writer, it is poetry that double speaks. And so there is some bit of double speak or whispering in this poetry. And that changes the format of the page. We hide our wet lakes behind the trellis of plants. Our voices honey from jaded soap of us. Our weekends are parties inside our heads, earphone to earphone. Tolerance in the dilemma of this rented place. No door of solace or shame yet for them. They will eat boyfriends and they will come with trouble and they will eat me and. But sometimes we translate into vixens. Late night party girls with eye masks. Returning on the stairs. Shh. The landlord is insomnic. To stilettos and side slits of little black dresses. Books, menstrual cups, and spandex. Who will take responsibility for them? And. Emerald nights pass into eight mornings. The sapphire of our headscarves and prayer mats, from insular to secular by two by two boxes. We curl each night against thoughts of saffron eyes, bloodshot. If the nights fall over our skin, our bodies become bottles of wine with a crack against it, dripping, dripping. They will get away and wooden cages with wooden birds flapping to horizons. We scrape air like parchment, peeling secrets from walls of adopted jail houses. They will grow wings and serpentine winds belching histories of women who left when they heard the bricks squeaking, shh, and not again, and please behave yourselves. But we play safe in these dog two chuckles, our cycle tires gripping the road's ruggedness. As Alleve shivered the broken sky of old whispering neighbors. All this for only one proper peg to place the key of our russet city freedoms. They are my short skirts and Simon's partition poem reminded me of the partition poem I had written to the Raza. And uh, it was written when I was in, while I was conversing with a translator poet friend of mine who was, who was translating uh, Sufi saying Sachin Sarmat's works. And she was talking of the difficulty of translation from languages that were ancient to now modern. And I, I don't know what happened, but that's how a poem attacks you. You go home and it emerges from the dust. And this poem emerged in its entirety. It was a journey, and we see the journey. To the Raza. Those who do not know history climb the Thar Express, not its brutal roofs. As hibernal winds destroy distance, cloud specters over Chula smoke. From barren trees, dusk falls beneath the international train, blood seeping into beyond fruit. The engine noise resides at zero one station. Final point of immigration, perforated edges of identity, season tickets of contraband memory. The air nippy along the years, long checks of passport, blue, green. A steam wait for visa in sunset day, freezing through smokes from media number 30. Smells of kebabs and parathas under warm blankets. On the other side lies a dragnet of overused British day rails for trade. She hears such verses from a lot of over frayed neck, an unused key of a rusted trunk thrown into a well of human ancestors years ago. She quenches starlight in such suras. Where crowds are, there I am not. Those who do not know history click images of sun rouge galaxy, blood thawing skies, chocolate biscuit wrappings fleeing to Arctic metal flows of a carriage of new border crossings, in old silences of one million basal sighs, disembogging ten million permanent stars. She now translates the Sufi's verses. Our bond was created for a reason. Slumber has created illusions. Endless ones from endless books moving to further cores. Smothered ab agony in an unnecessary museum for refugee things. Sin did not remain, a sin made connecting. At Munabao, the TTP folks' bag 
bags and respecting vegetables in a hot place, pulling down beddings, opening suitcases. Everything is a weapon. A one-year-old child, a cone of boiled groundnuts, almonds from a tin, skittering. The road to Sachu is fraught in old Gamuki, words slipping over postmodern tongue. I was sitting by the roadside when the path became clear. No one wants its sipper to enter Mehran's alluvial plains, the Indus River, the Thar Desert, the Tirtan Mountains. Sachu himself was in search of peace, for long, to forgive the hangover from, from an inflamed life. Freezing joints, the train trundles, cries, wire borders, mass troops, customs officers. She will go to Karachi, Hyderabad, in Sin, Quetta, in this train for the poor where everyone carries temperate gifts, coconuts, elaichis, pressure cookers, palm, cashew. Many don't fill forms or no signature. They rely on one family member's passport for all. A married daughter who misses Chamya from Hyderabad, India. A childless Bilwara mill worker traveling to see his nieces. A Kashmiri shawl merchant visiting his father's grave. An indoor jeweler's parents living on both sides. A Bollywood hopeful who loves India more than her parents. A Naranda tailor adopted by an Indian uncle for a better life. A clerk from Palumpur. A peanut seller questioned about the limits of the South Asian free trade agreement. As a train stalls, time in limbo, she translates such a If I interpret love for all times, a hundred resurrections will pass, and yet my community will not end. She waits for momentum now, in any direction. The savoir-faire of time, the explicit march of reminiscence, or just plain exaltation and meditation. And my last poem will be, uh, I, I, I can never leave a bone poem or some bone reference sharing the half identity of being born and Mumbai girl. This is of course a funny poem, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a family gossip. The best part being that my family members are not poets and they don't read poetry. Gathering. My uncle had a strange habit of gathering people. Not less than 25 he would take on an outing. Like Auntie Papachin with her breast cut would lift her t-shirt every time to show us a story. Abo would stand and take a piss like a giraffe. Cousin Milton would talk about everyone's pants and panties. Uncle Ketan who divorced his wife just before he turned blind and regretted it in hindsight. Or Aunt Bertha who loved her husband so much, they still bathe in the picnic showers and saggy flesh of 40 years, a couple that bathes together. Aunt Nysa, who starved to look thin and ended up haggard because one kg less is not a year younger. And Aunt Alice, who was divorced when he was still a stigma. Uncle Milfred had one phrase for every occasion in lyrical company, aimed to marginalize his opponents, who had marginalized him because of his poverty. My father would step further and further away from the kids' cycling, as he could from the circle of life and everyone's life cycle. A few spare uncles would always sit on plastic chairs, innovating alcohol bottles. Aunt Cassandra would be on a fertility pill, counting milestones of others' children and practicing her lotus-like parenting wisdom. Matilda Aunt Obitin, around with curries and sotel, and cutlets fried in rava and cheap sunflower oil. People relished her friendship offerings, but never invited her for their parties. And the servants, Equal of equal of the dinner plates with their head full of lies, they wore shots in their bras outside their t-shirt, they smoked bees, hovered around the male cousins with bronze cricket thighs, and giggled their cousin Milton until they were molested and shunted home. My auntie, uncle's wife, would be interested in every soup and its recipe, never mind which house or hotel we were in. Nothing escaped her sight, even in daily Navinas, Angelus, or Rosalie's. The peas in the pula born between Martha and Rosie, the Filipino work on Amos gold bangles, the Saturday Jimmy uncle coming, the mouse either brought home. My uncle would cut long journeys short with church mouse jokes on trains to go on, big journeys and mirage. He would take pictures of good salad with as much panache as Uncle Fred and Tony beat a 
of their lives. And Auntie Emma stitched her husband's pocket from the opening outside so he wouldn't lend any more money. Every time Eve taught her class, there would be mayhem for all of us, the other children. When she got a job with a heavy pay packet, my aunt searched for zeros in every person, like ingredients in a soup. We had neither high marks nor the money. We were the barriers, patrons of penury. The day never belonged to us, as our aunt whipped us with a blue-eyed gaze in this room full of people. By the way, Michelle, I'm yet to come across a poet whose family leads poetry. So, <laughs> we will figure out along that. Pick up that. So, okay, I'll, I'll read a poem on poets. It's called Home. Which page of which book will be open before my eyes when I take my last breath? Which line of a poem will I be staring at? Perhaps only one thought will invoke an all nighter of the heart. Why could a titan tightly embrace the flawed creator of the flawless lines? I kept searching for a place for dreams, for a reason behind words. What I found the eyelids melted. This was the very place where dreams become letters without their presses. There was a postman who used to enter to the back door. Never saw him. How could I even claim that the letters I had received were indeed mine? The same friends I couldn't talk to by day kept coming in my dreams. I kept finding the paper boats they floated in a slow river. Others must have also received mine, friends I couldn't see from where I sat by the river. Water couldn't erase the ink, perhaps it also had warmed up to some written message. There was no dialogue. Even so, words were always exchanged at some addresses. Even if the same river did not appear in the dreams of all friends, each of us blessed the invisible postman who made our homes the destinations of letters without addresses. Every home connected heart to heart became the poet's home. Nice. This one is handkerchief. In love, some mornings are so tangible they come fluttering like sunlit linen. Some wrap you in this silent blend. Some swallow the soul's dwelling. Others stretch overhead like the roof of a marquee, imprinted with the lyrics, immortalizing the beloved. But it's only the one the little one kept folded in the pocket that you keep unfurling, for every inch of it is embroidered with your lover's name. This one is titled, One Month. Stepping aboard a train makes me want to alight at an anonymous station on a very bright morning and stay there for one full month without knowing the name of the place. Let there be such a small city that no shop within it carries the city's name, where the rickshawala, when I ask him to take me home, drops me anywhere provided the place is close to a river. Where no house has a TV, but only an old radio covered with a cloth and set in a niche which remains turned off most of the time and which guesses the time only by the sparrows chirping outside the window. A radio which not only brings here things from various stations but also carries a little bit of news from here to there. A radio which 
as soon as it's turned on, tells us only this much, that each inhabitant of every city boarded a train at night and having alighted at an anonymous station on the very bright morning of the next day and without knowing the name of the place, is realizing the dream of staying there for one full month. I think it's still not too late to thank Professor A.J. Thomas and Dr. Rao for having me here. Thank you, Sanat Academy. Thanks. Oh. Uh, so show me your bike. Oops, my bad. Uh, yes. uh, the title of the poem is Hindustan. न समझो कि तुम मिट जाओगे हिंदुस्तान वालों तुम्हारी दास्तान तक भी ना होगी दास्तान अलाव ना पार सिंधु ने बड़े साइलेंट हैज बीन सिंस टाइम इन द वर्ल्ड इट्स माउथ इज़ द ड्रीम ऑफ़ गॉड्स वाइड डीप इनफ़ टू हाउस थाउजेंड्स ऑफ़ इयर्स इन सिविलाइजेशन दैट कैन नॉट बी रैप्ड इवन इन द एर्थ इस प Sindhu, Sindhustan, Hindu, Hindustan, the rhyme, the alliteration, shaping kingdoms, that later becomes a pigeon's inside, a neatly folded sky. The river pushes her body forward, the sun, a pale lamp, floats on the waters, looks up to Hindu Kush, tries to shade mother goddesses or dancing girls of Mohenjo-daro who smile at us from behind musing glasses. Ask them if those who came through silk road brought more silk to the berry covered brownie, or sold fruit trees in the tongue, a sweetness that oozes from sonnets, from a deep well of curly letters that open history's chest, more ancient than the stars that women and children in the old crawl through the filigree of a bronze lantern glowing on a table or maybe a tablet reserved for posterity to read its red red from the blood on streets from mouths that kiss the syllables of Kalima and Bambi Matara blood of child men in skull caps torn into pieces here we have the titles of Sona, the diamonds in the pit of throne now that you have a symbol they are in molds of turtles either. Can you bury the touch of hell inside their graves? Or send love to love with them? If they are thrown into the Indian Ocean, they sometimes look like the priest king himself, with his nose broken under the vigilance of the third eye. Was it gold or a gun wound? They too will be excavated someday by those who look alive. But claim to wear a red or saffron, third eye, the foreheads. What do they know of the genes that are mixed in the sea floors of Gulf of Persia, an island city of Dwarka? Which carbon dating can separate gods embedded in the heart's veins, which is nothing but a sketch mirrored back from the above? It opens its eyes and weeps over puddles of blood, black babies, burnt trains. It tries to find which color it belongs to, the rights and the wrongs. Roses, four names of the dead, the red, centered, yet broken by priceless necklaces. River Sindhu saw her forest swallow the brick kilns, the kit and kin. She was silent in the 5,000 years ago, silent when she changed her course. She will be silent again. And she changes and chooses her geography, her ocean, to pour her heart into. She's tired of carrying her back bricks of a broken civilization. She might deposit the names in the star or in the star. In the womb of oceans and the world will forget it among its lost treasures till it is awakened again by invaders or rivers. Um, my next poem is uh, on uh, 
fruit pomegranate. So yes, I'm probably wrongly pronouncing it again. So whenever I go to uh, the shopping centers around to buy for fruit, and pomegranate happens to be my favorite fruit, I end up saying, do you have pomegranate? <laughs> And uh, uh, when uh, you read uh, this uh, novel, The Kalikrama by Khalid Hussaini, it talks about two young boys and it talks about a lot of pomegranates. And a long time ago, somebody misspelled the city Hera is heart. So it talks about that. And of course, MS Word never accepts the wrong spelling. It never accepts what you want to tell it. So the title of the poem is, Is this pomegranate a poem? <coughs> The way Herat is always misspelled as heart. Similarly, I spell one grenade. A red line trembles under the name of the fruit. Open the chambers, the ripe ruby seeds glisten in the darkness that were second chewed. Blue hummingbirds flung the songs in the crown proud, taught even under a knife. Its silver is the clips in purple jewels, ink bleeds, flushes on body clay. The juicy jewels are called angels that touch the table. Its wood is a forest of stories. The winds are horses, flowing down a girl's throat. Who hears the Arabic word Roman and the romance of something exotic, something distant, the longing of the unknown and vicious. The world takes the body in exchange. Her fingers gently touch the crushed crown, the fallen rain, the empty heart. Violet lips takes the knife, the stubborn metal, her language, turns ruby red, dwell bright, haunt and fresh. Its red is on the calligraphy around the mouth of a child born in a burning house. Thank you so much, and thanks. I think I made one stop. Um, thank you to Mr. Sarojit and Dr. Kumar for bringing this courage to you. And thank you, audience, for listening to us. Uh, while expressing our sincere thanks to Roshel, Sarojit, and Saima, friends, we hope that you enjoyed some very fine poetry this evening from these three young poets. The Academy takes pride. The Academy takes pride in bringing such literary evenings before the literary lovers like you. We would request your valued participation in these programs in future too. I would now request all of you to please join us at the Club of Tea outside. Thank you very much.